Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight uh, to this talk between John Burris and Carol Beasley uh, in uh, uh, collaboration with the exhibit Still Looking. Uh, as many of you know, Still Looking is a survey of Carol Beasley's collecting practices over the last, what, 40, 50 40 years? years? 40 years. Um, it includes one of her photographs, but uh, much of that exhibition is drawn from the permanent collection here at the museum, which she has oh so generously given us over the last couple of decades, um, as well as photography that you may not have seen unless you've been in Carol's home. Uh, many of those photographs um, are, are being shown publicly here for the first time, uh, and it's really a fantastic exhibit. Carol just gave a uh, fantastic gallery talk on Tuesday, uh, and so I'm, I'm sure we're all ready to hear further insights into her practice as a collector. Um, tonight, um, Carol will be talking with John Burris. Um, John perhaps also needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Uh, John is uh, something of a legend here in Oklahoma City. He has been here working as a curator, a dealer, and a photographer uh, for much of his mature career. Um, you probably know him for his affiliation with either the International Photography Hall of Fame, with the Hefner Collection of China Chinese art or with Untitled Art Space, um, John has been uh, a consistent presence in um, talking about collecting uh, and getting us to look closer at photography um, over the last couple of decades. And so it's a real pleasure to have him here tonight uh, to talk to Carol about collecting. So without further ado, uh, I will step off the stage to allow our two uh, featured speakers to talk at more length. So please join me in welcoming both John Burris and Carol Beasley. Well, I'm uh, very honored to uh, be asked to speak uh, about my friend Carol Beasley and her exhibition Still Looking. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Mark. Um, when I was told the uh, title of the exhibit, Still Looking, I thought, how appropriate, uh, because that truly defines Carol as a collector. She is still looking. She has been for a very long time. I'll describe as we get into the evening uh, how she began her journey as a collector in 1973, and she's still active today. But I, but I also thought this begs the question, what, what compels someone to start collecting, collecting anything, but collecting photography uh, as we're addressing now? What motivates collectors to do what they do? Um, how long does the process last? How long can it last? How long uh, should it last? Uh, to put together a symbol of a, a good collection, such as Carol's. Um, so this is part of also what I hope to discuss this evening. For those of you who know Carol, uh, you probably know that for the last few years, um, on an annual basis, basis, she's been going to London for the theater season. And um, while she's there, uh, she also sees the museums, and tours, the, tours the latest exhibitions. About a year ago, she went to the Tate Modern to see an exhibition called The Radical Eye. Um, and it was, the, it was the collection, massive collection, of Sir Elton John. And uh, about, I don't know, a few, few weeks after Carol got home, she brought me this, this beautiful catalog for the exhibition, which again, as I said, was, it, it's hard to imagine the number of works uh, that uh, Elton John has collected. Uh, and, and that were exhibited in this one major exhibition. Um, but in the, collect, in the catalog, uh, there was a great interview uh, with um, his dealer uh, describing how he got into collecting. And uh, it was interesting in that he said himself, he said, in 1990, when I came out of rehab for alcohol and drug addiction, I was told that I needed something to occupy my time and become immersed in. Uh, he further says that he went to France to visit with some friends, uh, and while he was there, he saw an exhibition of modernist photography from the 1920s and 30s. And he said he was totally blown away and immediately purchased a few pieces and then obsessively, obsessively went after a lot more. And he said that this is what I think is most, uh, most important. He said, this sustained him through the difficult time 
of staying sober. And that, to me, uh, is a very interesting definition, sustaining. And I, I sort of chose to call my, uh, our discussion this evening the sustainability of collecting photography because I propose that with the exception of rehab, Carol, uh, the same has been tr true for Carol. She has uh, had a, she discovered photography and it has sustained her through many years, through uh, many different journeys that she's made as an artist and an educator. And uh, she's passed along her passion for photography to her students that she taught here at the university. Um, her collection will sustain generations of these students uh, as they will be able to view uh, superb examples uh, in this collection of photographic prints by great photographers throughout the history of the medium. So that is, a, is sustaining as well. Some things you might not know about Carol, I'll just give you a little bit of background before we start talking, is that uh, she received her undergraduate degree uh, in English uh, and her MA uh, from uh, the University of Kentucky, Lexington. Uh, she went to the University of Dallas, uh, got her MA in art, where she began to paint and study ceramics. Um, so her, her beginnings were not in photography, and as, you, as you'll learn, it was much later that she got, became involved with photography or introduced to it. Um, she went on to California, receiving her MFA from UCLA in 1968, uh, specializing in ceramics, um, although she was also painting. Uh, in her final, final semester at UCLA, she was encouraged to take a class in photography. And one of her instructors was the noted photographer Robert Heineken, whose work we'll see tonight was in the, uh, one of his uh, pieces in the um, exhibition. Um, and as I think she will describe, it was there that she began her fascination with the medium of photography, even though she was not involved at that point in it herself. Uh, her teaching career ultimately led her here to OU in 1973. It was varied, not again associated with photography initially. Um, and it wasn't until 1982 when Sam Olkoniski, who was the director of the museum and was also teaching photography courses, when he retired that Carol began teaching history of photography. That is about when we met. And as we get into the photographs this evening and talk, I'll, we'll, we'll learn more about that relationship. Uh, but she also began collecting actively, more actively at that time. What I want to say is it's very difficult today when we, when we think of how, how popular photography is uh, as a medium, how collectible it is, what you read everywhere uh, is nothing that was, that was nothing like that in 1973. Um, I was fortunate to be coming right out of school at that time and it's, historically, it's sort of related to what they call the boom in photography. 1973 was the start of the boom in photography. I was very lucky to be able to watch that develop as a young curator. And um, it, it was just, it's so amazing to think today how different it is in, in all respects. But certainly, uh, photography was not, there the, the prices for photography, for example, I mean, you could buy masterpieces, masterworks, for hundreds of dollars, which is impossible today if you can even find the masterworks. Um, it was just a much different time. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, but what I hope to do is talk about uh, Carol's motivation for collecting, uh, her access to acquiring photographs through her association with dealers that she's met, such as myself, uh, and the photographers themselves. Uh, I have been fortunate to work with a number of collectors, um, no one more interesting than Carol, uh, be, no, more, no one more diverse in her taste and her, her uh, motivations as Carol, and I hope that becomes clear as we begin to look at some photographs this evening. Um, so, I think we'll just start. I said that Carol was not a photographer, but as you've, if you've been through the exhibition, <laughs> You, you see that her, her first photograph was actually dated 1973. Carol, what can you tell us about this photograph that's, that's <laughs> I mean, that is, that is uh, so special to your association with photography? Well, I, what ha <clears throat> my story has a, a lot of humor. I was busily and walked around with a timer around my neck because I was timing, casting, castings of clay. 
and everyone thought it was like it was like, a, and I was dirty from top to bottom, and and I also had all of these friends at UCLA who were photographers, and they shamed me into taking in my last quarter at UCLA a class in photography, and I just absolutely went crazy. I mean, it was like going from literally light to dark, the dark room. And I began, I had this clunky uh, waist-high camera that couldn't really be focused. Now, someone said, well, I could focus it. Well, I couldn't. So I just, and I just, I don't know, but I had a mannequin, half of a mannequin that had hands with it as an OJ, you know, that I got somewhere. And so I had this friend there, and I was living in downtown L.A., above the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion on a hill, and these, you could see the Japanese farmers planting their crops on this big hill if you have ever been to LA. And my friend was there, and I just decided to shoot this roll of film, and I happened to do this and put this mannequin's hand in his pocket and what you see at his feet, which you'll have to, you can't really see it very well, but you see that kind of white shape down there, which you can see in the photograph if you look at it, was the mold for the castings that I was making in <laughs> ceramics, which I then um, added to cast kind of brick-like shapes the whirly thing, but it was, what those were, were burps of plastic that had come out of a factory in Los Angeles that coated wire. And this friend of mine brought them, and of course I just went ecstatic over them. And so I learned how to cast ceramics, and so that's what that is. And then this is uh, probably a cat hair. <laughs> and if all of you who know me, are having a hilarious fit. So the, everything in this is a big mistake. The cat hair, which you can't really see very well, but there are a couple of light spots. See, there's one over here at the corner, and then there's one further down that the hand is pointing at. And you can see it upstairs, and those were air bubbles, because the first thing you learn when you put a, a roll of film into a container is to tap it so that the air bubbles get out of it. Well, I didn't do that. I just went ahead and developed the film. And this was just like a total accident, all these things that came together. And that explains a lot about the fascination of photography for everyone, is you never really know what you have until you uh, get the pictures back. But you printed, this is your print too. I you printed did. you made the print. Oh no, I printed this. This was my, out of my camera, the clunky handheld camera. And as I uh, mentioned, so many things that have changed since that time. There was no digital. There was, no. there were no personal computers that you could sit down. There was no Adobe Photoshop. There was, a, I mean, it was, it was a much, much different process. Had been for a very long time in photography. It's changed so dramatically now. Uh, what you're seeing in Carol's exhibition though, is the product, for the most part, of non-digital, uh, film-based, as, as Carol was, was doing here. Now, Carol, as I mentioned, was also a painter. And I asked her, you know, when, when, if you look at the exhibition, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, but not surprised, because I've known the collection for a long time, but the, the number of portraits versus the number of landscapes. Because Carol, as a painter, doesn't paint portraits. Carol paints landscapes. And I asked her what what it was that in you know has interested her in collecting landscape photographs and painting landscape, which uh, let me see. I'm sorry. Oh no. Nope. And she and she told me anyway. And what I should say is that she told me that it was postcards, picture postcards that she had seen on family and trips and collected uh, at that time. Which actually, if you recall, the postcards they looked a little bit like this, but. Let's go on up to the time that Carol came to OU, um, and you didn't really continue in photography. That was not something no, that you I, continued. No, I took in. that one class in studio photography, and that was it. And the reason that I abandoned it, as I did ceramics for painting, was that it was too much of a process. 
I don't like anything. I like to put the paint on the canvas and that's what stays there. And it won't move until I change it. And in photography, I just was in, but I haven't, John doesn't know this, but one of the marvelous things about photography early on that they showed those landscapes that you see upstairs, that quality, which are mostly pictures of the sublime, which go back to 19th century uh, fascination with the landscape, transcendentalism, and uh, all of the massive pictures of the American landscape. Can you, can you tell, tell that Carol was an instructor in photography, history of photography? But anyway, or, but what he was so wonderful about it was that, um, is that all of these remain, you know, once you have a photograph, that infinitesimal exposure is going to be like that forever. So that's kind of, but for the same reason I quit ceramics, I also never wanted to actually do, draw. that was not going to be my artistic voice. But I fell in love with all of these beautiful, real photographs in the seminar that I took with Robert Heineken. One of the great things that, that Carol did was uh, also help bring in noted photographers for lectures and uh, appearances here at the university, uh, which is where we met in 1987. She brought in Mary Ellen Martin, very well-known documentary photographer. Um, and uh, I, I came to the lecture because uh, I, I was a big fan of Mary Ellen's. And I, I had called Carol and I said, Carol, I would love to meet Mary Ellen. Um, I'm representing photographers. I had a gallery at that time. And I said, I'm representing photographers internationally, and I would really like to meet, uh, would really like to meet Mary Ellen and uh, talk to her possibly about working with her. Carol was so nice in facilitating that, introduced us that first evening. The photograph on the right is a photograph that I understand was given to you by Mary Ellen Mark on, the, on that occasion. But it was not the only photograph. It isn't, as you'll see in the exhibition, um, Mother Teresa on the right. And I asked Carol, you know, how, you know, in, in the beginning, was she meeting with, with the photographers directly, like Mary Ellen, and obtaining things? Was she, meet, was she meeting dealers such as myself? What did she depend on? And one of the fascinating things she told me, which brought me way back in my history, was that she got a lot of her photographs in the beginning from the Friends of Photography, which was an organization that Ansel Adams started in Carmel, California. Um, and the Friends of Photography was a, a vehicle for his teaching his workshops, which I, I took myself. Um, but it also, in order to raise money for, for a gallery and the program, the ongoing uh, efforts for the Friends of Photography, they would have photographers each year. Uh, they would make a selection of five, six different photographers. And they, those photographers would make their work available at a much reduced price. Uh, to collectors, and so if you supported the Friends of Photography, you would get a brochure like the one on the left, and this was from 1987. I found this in my files. I, I, I was trying to remember when that was. It's 87, and this was the photograph that Carol got from that, uh, from, from the Friends of Photography at that time. And when you look at the number of photographs and going through her exhibition upstairs that she obtained through the Friends of Photography, it's quite amazing because uh, you'll see as we get into this, for example, Sally Mann, Everybody know who Sally Mann is or are familiar with Sally Mann? She is a photographer, an incredible photographer, who uh, has gotten quite a bit of controversy over photographing her family, her children at a young age, and mostly uh, doing nudes of these uh, children. Um, but she, her career had started long before that, that ser series of works uh, actually took off or, or was introduced. This is a photograph that was offered through the Friends of Photography, and it actually came out, it, it's from, uh, it's untitled, and, and she said 1982, 85, because she couldn't remember exactly when it was made, but it was from a book called At 12, Portraits of Young Women. And uh, she was photographing young, uh, young people with families in this situation. Uh, all of the children had to be 12. Fascinating project, but when you look at it, when you think about it, this, 
this was really predated when this was offered to the Friends of Photography. Sally wasn't very well known at that time. And it's amazing to me that that photograph, such a beautiful photograph that's in the collection, uh, came, uh, you know, came from that, uh, from the Friends of Photography. Another thing, if you, you see fo these photographs, the sheer beauty of the prints, all, so many of the photographers' works in, in this exhibition, all of the photographers in, actually, but so many, like Sally Mann, the prints are absolutely beautiful and incredible. Uh, a lot of them are contact prints, which means the negatives were this size. Sally worked in large format, uh, so the prints are absolutely beautiful. You just don't see that uh, in the same way. And then I'm not gonna be one to say, oh, I prefer the old days, I prefer silver prints, because there's so many wonderful digital prints and uh, prints in the exhibition that are digital prints uh, today. But there is a difference. And again, what I was saying was sustaining things. Uh, the, the, the ability of students in photography classes today at the university to go and see works like this from the history of photography, not dating back all that long ago, 73, and you think about between 73 and today, how much has changed, it's, it's really amazing. So um, one of the things that I ask, you know, every time I would see a new photograph uh, at Carol's or in exhibitions for works that she's donated, I, I would find something that I hadn't, I, I didn't realize where it, come, where it had come from. I didn't, hadn't talked to Carol about where she had received her thing. So when, we, when I saw this, Frederick Summer, Again, one of my absolute heroes in photography, um, incredible printer, and the print that you see upstairs is, is just beyond compare, I think. But I asked her how she got this photograph, and I want Carol to tell you how she got it, because again, the relationship with dealers is so very important to a collector. Uh, Frederick Summer is by far the most inspirational photography for me. I even wrote a note or two about what I used to see in his pictures. And this, he, these, his photographs bear out all the things that John talked about, about seeing a beautiful print. And so when you go upstairs and see the exhibit, which will be there until the end of December, so you have a chance to go up and see all these again, is how he combined, he combined, uh, everything about life and the stages of life in this, in this photograph. And he always, in mo most of his pictures, he reminds you of the failure, I mean, he reminds you of decimation of, of the background. He uses this very much. My favorite, which I uh, did not put in the show, um, that I use when I give talks on my collection is, my favorite is the jackrabbit. I have four of his pictures, and my dealer in Santa Fe, Janet Russick, who is Scheinbaum and Russick in Santa Fe, I just gave them a whole list of the things that I was looking for, many of which were found up, upstairs by them. But uh, the the jackrabbit is the one that I love the most. It's not in the show, but this is his most well-known picture. And uh, it's just exquisitely beautiful. And that's the photograph just captures reality in a way. But this reminds you of, this is almost a funereal way that uh, figures were represented in uh, 19th century uh, figurative photography when everyone would take pictures of people in coffins. Folded hands. With the folded hands. And then, all, and Frederick Summer uses a lot of these backgrounds. And I have a, uh, one of my photographs is of Max Ernst. And it's a double exposure, which also talks about the, um, the decimation of the flesh in this double exposure with a wall like this. And the jackrabbit looks like a paver has gone on over it. It was a roadkill. It was actually it was, it a was really a roadkill, but it's so beautifully articulated. It's just totally flat. He photographed it from above, and it was the one I wanted. One of the discussions I've heard about this particular photograph, and you, when you look at it, and it, it's, it shows in the slide 
of course, when you look at the, our photograph, when you look at these, it's not, nothing like, obviously, seeing them in person. But one of the discussions has always been, a lot of students have asked that, you know, why are the eyes so wide in this photograph? Well, uh, Summer was a, an exceptional printer. These are 8 by 10 contact prints that he made, um, meaning 8 by 10, meaning that you use an 8 by 10 inch camera or the negative is 8 by 10 inches. And instead of enlarging it, you put it directly on a piece of paper and you make a contact print. So the fidelity is incredible. But what does that mean in the process? There are things you can do with a contact print. You can dodge and burn and you know, do the things that people would normally do with a projected image and enlarger. But there are other things you can't do. So the question remained for a long time, how did he get those eyes so white? The exposure of the white dress and the eyes would never, would never have been that way. I mean, it would never have worked out that way. It would not have looked, the eyes would not have been that light and that bright white. He bleached them. He, he made the print, and then he went in with a small brush and bleached the eyes on I that. I didn't know that. I didn't, think, I didn't know if you did or not. And, that's, and he got that, the same value of the eyes and the same value of the dress, which is a bit surreal, which is obviously he had an interest in the surrealist. And it's fascinating. It's what's, what's more important is <laughs> I, I, to, to think about when you think about how these prints are made is the, uh, the time and the effort and the expertise that it took to, to produce them. I spent the last four years of my career teaching history of photography at UCO. And uh, the students that would come in, um, all of their, mo most of what they knew, most of what they s saw in the way of their news and their media came to them on a screen this size or maybe just a little bit bigger on a laptop. And I, I brought a collection to the university. Uh, the Photographic Society of America had a collection of 5,000 uh, prints dating throughout the entire history of photography. Every process was, was uh, available to see, from platinum printing, done by chromate printing, every, every kind of uh, print process that had been developed in the history of photography was available. And I would bring these prints into class, and I would show them the prints, and they would say, the, the first question was, how did they do this without Photoshop? How did they get this without Photoshop? I mean, that Photoshop, Photoshop, they were so dependent on that. And, and then in, in the process, being able to see an 8 by 10 print or a 16 by 20 inch print like you see in this exhibition was so much of an improvement over this. And it, it really was, uh, it left a lot of questions certainly in my mind uh, that I had to try to deal with for four years. But it's a different world, different world in the, pro the prints that you see, the, the appreciation is just so very different today. Um, now, Besides working with collect, I mean, besides working with uh, dealers and uh, friends of photography, things like that, Carol also was able to get a, a, a many, many wonderful works from instructors or students uh, here at the University of Oklahoma. This is one example. Uh, Andrew Strout, who was a, a professor here in the photography, taught photography. Uh, what I'm showing you here, what I f f if you go back. Portrait of young girls, portrait of young girls. We saw Sally Mann's portrait. Um, Todd Stewart, currently a professor here. Uh, color, difference in color. And I want to talk about the difference in color in black and white as we go through some things. I, one of my favorite stories in regards to that is I, I by the mid-'80s, I was able to ha have a fairly good collection of photographs myself. And I was beginning to hang them in my home, and I needed some lighting. And I called an electrician in. Uh, one day to help install some track lighting, and um, came in and he, he, I, he spent a lot of time looking at the photographs, and I had Ansel Adams and Edward Weston, some, some really wonderful examples of the history of photography and some wonderful prints, and he said, these are very, very, very nice. I said, well, thank you very much. He said, he said uh, they'd have been a lot better if they were in color, though, and so I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, what about, everyone's a critic, but everyone has their, 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 uh, their choices over one or the other. What, what in, in photography, it, it took a long time in those boom years from, from 73 up into the 80s into the 90s. Um, it, it, one of the things that's interesting as a, as a dealer was that color, I mean, people, collectors didn't buy color photographs. Now, why would that be? 
I mean, it was, it was just not done. All of the collecting in, was in black and white. Mm -hmm. Anybody have an idea why that was? Because color prints didn't last. Color prints were delicate at the time. You couldn't hang them on your wall and not have them fade. Uh, you could buy dye transfer prints for, for a little bit more permanent. It was a process that was a little more permanent, but it, it still was, was difficult. Museums didn't buy because it was a problem of how to store them. They would have to have them in the Museum of Modern Art set up a cold storage unit just for photography, just for color photography. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of museums couldn't, were prohibited from doing that. So it wasn't collected for a long time. The, one of the advantages of digital is that today, digital prints last a very long time, as long as most silver prints. So it is a different process, and it is something that uh, has enabled you know, the, the market to expand for color photography to collectors. But this is a beautiful example of a, digital, a color digital print that you'll see in the exhibition by Todd Stewart. Um, now, as I said, it's going through this. I divided my, in my mind the portraits and the landscapes. My collection has been uh, focused on landscape photography, including photographers like William Clift. Um, in fact, it's almost predominantly landscape photography. Carol's collection is, is so fascinating because it really is portraits and landscapes. And you can, as we get in, you'll see, I'm, I'm gonna say this may be documentary. You may consider this a documentary photograph. Well, maybe it's just a single portrait. But this photograph of uh, Shiprock by uh, William Clift it was made in 1975. Uh, William Clift was from Boston, originally Boston. Uh, Interesting side, he was Montgomery Cliffs, the actor's uh, nephew. Um, he moved to Santa Fe uh, in the early 70s and began making photographs in the American West. Uh, he had been, he had trained uh, under Paul Caponegro, whose work you'll see here too, uh, in Boston. But he moved uh, to Santa Fe and when I opened my gallery, I opened it with an exhibition of William Cliff. Um, he was a very difficult person to deal with because he didn't like dealers. He didn't, uh, he, he didn't mind selling his work but, and getting it out, but he wanted to know where it went to. It went, it was, there were a lot of conditions that you had to work with uh, William Cliff. When, when uh, Carol and I were talking about this print, I asked her where it came from. She didn't at first remember, but I did. This was a print that I had sold from my gallery to a, a collector in Oklahoma City Collector was deceased. The family called me and said there were, you know, we they had a very large collection of photographs. This was one of the uh, photographs from that collection. Carol came in, uh, made some incredible choices. Uh, took about a third of the collection that day, and uh, this was one of the prints in it. Anyway, it is again a supreme example of how good it can be in black and white. How beautiful uh, silver print can be. The sublimity, yeah. the sublime in nature. This was what I, I, I'm sorry, I got this oh, no, mixed really? before. This one, you, you were telling me that the, post, the color postcards, these were hand tinted black and white photographs that were turned into postcards for travel. This was what Carol was referencing when she started uh, uh, you know, painting. painting. And, she, and then also in the back of her mind were these, these vistas, these landscapes you know, in the American West. Paul Caponegro, who I mentioned earlier, Paul um, uh, was considered one of the mystics. Uh, he, uh, the, one of the sort of, I guess, transcendentalist in a way, had studied with Minor White, uh, Rochester. Uh, he's from Boston, and uh, early on became one of the, recognized as one of the greatest black and white printers. Uh, his photographs um, today, I mean, today he's part of the history of photography and, and certainly recognized as one of the greatest printers we have. Um, this is not tip particularly typical of Caponegro. Caponegro spent a lot of time probably best known for photographing uh, Stonehenge. Did an entire study of Stonehenge and Stone Dolmens um, in England, Ireland. Uh, maybe that's what he's best known for. Maybe in another image called Running White Deer. Uh, but this was a, a sort of atypical, although he had made a lot of photographs in the American West. Uh, his photographs, by comparison to Ansel Adams, are quite different. They're quite subtle. They're, there's a long total range and they're quite beautiful where Ansel's are, are dynamic, the blacks and the whites are there. I mean, they're, they're um, much more orchestrated and much more um, just, I, I don't know how to describe them by comparison other than to say Paul has, has, Paul's things I think are a lot more sensitive. 
But this, uh, what I think is so important to this collection is that it probably is atypical of, of a lot of what known of Caponegro's work, but yet again, it's the most beautiful photograph. You really have to see it in person. Alan Ross. Alan was, uh, do, do you remember, did, did this mm -hmm. come from Santa Fe? Yeah. Alan ended up in Santa Fe. He was a, a, one of Ansel he Adams. He was a guest artist here. Too. And here, that's right. And, uh, Alan was a, uh, an associate and a, an assistant to Ansel Adams um, back in the 80s, and he now uh, lives in Santa Fe and, uh, as you said, came here. Did you, did you get this directly from? No. What I think uh, one thing I'm going to go back and edit, the friends of photography, these are the kinds of oh, photographers that they selected, that printed to raise money. But what I would do is buy everyone's photograph. I wanted to tell you that. It wasn't just one or two. No. Yeah. I just bought them all. If there were six photographers in the brochure that year, she had all six of them is what she That's saying. right. And I made my contribution, and I got the, they had just the top line of beautiful, and so some of these, and I don't even remember which ones now, were the offerings of the Friends of Photography, and every, every year it was in business, I just bought a, everything. So if, just not to belabor the idea of prices and the value of photographs, but back then, when you think about it, when the Friends were offering things in the 70s and into the 80s, you were talking about the value of those prints, the retail value, would have been in the hundreds of dollars. I mean, maybe $600 or $700. That was not what the price of, you were getting them at a reduced price to the Friends of Photography, but you were still getting the same beautiful prints. There was no difference in that. Uh, the Sally Mann print that you see there, um, the, I, I can't imagine now, I, I don't know what the price was when it was offered to the Friends of Photography, but, uh, it's in the thousands of dollars today. One of the things that Carol and I both did is we were um, advisors for the Oklahoma Arts Institute uh, and, and worked on bringing photographers. If anybody knows the Art, Oklahoma Arts Institute, they, did a, they do a program for students in the summer, first two weeks in, in June, where high school students can come and study with well-known photographers and artists and uh, writers and uh, musicians. And uh, they had asked me to help bring in the kinds of photographers that I represent in my gallery. Carol was on the, uh, the advisory board to the Arts Institute along with me. And uh, Sally Mann uh, was someone that I, I was watching. I had seen her work. The, the, the photograph you see in the, in the beginning of her, the young girl uh, from the At 12 series, was what I knew. Uh, and I had decided that I wanted to invite her to be an instructor. Uh, she came. And what was interesting was um, she showed the At 12, but she showed a new body of work, which was called Immediate Family, which was the beginnings of the photographs that you know today uh, that have been a little bit more controversial. And I can remember um, sitting uh, in a room at Quartz Mountain, where the Oklahoma Arts Institute workshops were, and going through a box full of uh, photographs from the Immediate Family series. And we would always purchase works for the, uh, for the Arts Institute collection. And we were going through these, and I said, uh, is this a new body? Or this is, these, are, uh, these are really wonderful photographs. They're 16 by 20 inch, beautiful prints. And she says, yes. I said, how much? She said, I don't know. I haven't really set a price yet. I don't know, maybe $750 uh, for, for 16 by 20 photograph. And I said, OK, uh, we want two of those photographs, which we purchased. Today, those two same photographs are about $25,000 each. That was in, 19, in, in about 1988 when she came. Uh, so the market for photography has certainly increased, and the, the nature of, of the business has changed over the years, as Carol will attest to, certainly. Uh, this you can't see very well in this, in this, but this is a Fresson print, which is an unusual color process by a photographer named Bernard Plassou. I met Bernard in Santa Fe. He, he had moved there in the 70s, mid-70s, and uh, from Paris, and was uh, decided he wanted to photograph the American West. And um, he did mostly black and white. But when he did color, he, he didn't print the color himself. He actually didn't, like most French photographers, he didn't print his black and white either. But 
he certainly didn't print the, the color work of the Fresson. There was a family, uh, the Fresson family, just outside of Paris, who had used a process, and it was sort of like a dye transfer where you layer uh, one layer of color on top of another layer of color. You coat it with a different color, another color, and they, they go together to make a you know, full four-color photograph. It's a very unusual, very uh, rare process, but Bernard had all of his prints made that way. The thing that I liked about this, this was from the collection that I said that Carol, that I, I brought Carol to, same as from the Capa Negro. The thing that I liked about this photograph of Rancho de Taos, which so many wonderful photographers in the history of photography have, have photographed, um, Bernard made this in snow. When there's snow falling, you see the snowflakes on the front of, you know, in front of his camera. It's a very unusual photograph, but so delicate and so beautiful uh, as a process of in person when you see the photograph upstairs. What was, was your experience in Santa Fe, living in well, Santa Fe? Well, I have a story about Bernard Faucon, another French photographer, and the one upstairs that all of you who've seen the exhibit have noticed, it's these uh, mannequins with a burning, with the building burning in the background, mm -hmm. it's in color, and it has one real person in it, and they're all drinking something that's green from like cream de menthe, <laughs> you know. It's just hilarious. And uh, that is a, also a Fresson print. And that was the first photograph I bought from Costelli, from a big dealer in New York. And uh, Marvin Heiferman, who is a very well-known collector, and also author, author, and an author, and but he's the one who came as a guest artist to OU, and I arranged to buy it. And he, who is the? We have a couple of the photographs of the woman who does the 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 it displays and builds the rooms. Sandy Scoblin, right. right. and you could. Uh, she was also uh, another artist who came here. And it was always built making photographs, kind of like the Fresson, but hers were a whole other, a whole other thing. So, so many wonderful f uh, photographers came to the university uh, during Carol's tenure. She met them. You became, you, you mm -hmm. were able to get photographs directly from them, sometimes from their dealers. But um, uh, let's just keep going here. Let's, this is something. I mean, I, we talk about processes. The, the process, the Fresson process, is beautiful. It's, it's been used by a very small number of photographers because the way it works is if you're a photographer and you go to the Fresson family and you say, I want to, uh, you to print my photographs, they have the ability to say, to look at your photographs and say, we don't like those, we don't print them. And they don't do it. And so it's not everybody you, that can just go and have a Fresson print made. They have to really like your photographs, really like what you're doing. Uh, it's a very selective process. So, but so the process, so they're they're quite rare, in fact, and they're and they're really not the Fresson family is not working today. So, they're 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 historically important. This is a, a is a photograph that I I just absolutely think is wonderful. The print, I mean, when you look at the photograph, it's more than a print. And if you look at the whole description of of the pro, I, I included here of the process. Pre-ambrotype iris print, vegetable pigment on tree, bark paper coated with gum, Arabic, and ground mink. How long must it have taken for this photographer, Mary Del Rubenstein, to make this beautiful, beautiful piece of art? But it's certainly more, when you look at the print, it's, it's not like anything you've seen because it isn't like any process. It's a unique process that she has created, layer upon one layer. Of, one of a kind. One of a kind, in a, a unique print, too. So. If you haven't seen this, take a look at this. This is it again. It this it pales, you know, the, the projection pales by comparison to the print. But I was I what I find fascinating is the variety of processes. Can you talk about that for a moment, if you would? About are you drawn to process, or are you drawn to the to the content of the photograph first? I I knew because I taught history of photography. I knew a lot about how to do all those. Uh, processes, you know, tin types and all the others. So I was drawn to the uniqueness of this and the very fact that I'd also seen it OU 
another whole portfolio of Meridale's Rubenstein. I could not believe that the same photographer did this other set, which were low riders. You know, everybody know what a low rider is? It's a car that's been altered and it bumps up and it bumps down. And, but Meridale Rubenstein, which we actually have in, in the collection, and so I couldn't believe that she, that was a motivating factor as well, that someone would take the patience to do something like this. It looks 19th century of an anonymous tree like you used to see. Well, Post Oak, Oklahoma, so it's. Yeah. Uh, so here we have the, an ancient process with the lowriders come to Oklahoma. Holly Roberts. Explain the, how you. This how was came one to get this. of the first things I bought, and Holly Roberts was also an artist who came to the Quartz Mountain uh, uh, workshops. Workshops, and I just liked her work because I like she combined painting and photography, and we have about what four or five of her pieces, some of which Sam Okonetsky liked too. She. He really liked her work, and so we have a good representation. And this was one of the first ones I bought. And it's actually a photograph of a dead horse with a drawn person on it. And it's upstairs, too. So There's more painting involved in this than photography. I mean, the basic basis for it is, is a photograph, but there's so much paint that's been applied to this, and it's become something, um, a mixed-media piece. Um, but that's what she does. It I mean, is what, what she does, but I mean, were you as a painter, did, did that have some motivation for you? I really don't really remember. I just always enjoyed it, and I was just drawn to it. And I love the idea that people, because I've always liked to combine things and extend the medium, and I don't think John took a picture of it, but I must call your attention to the fake moss upstairs on that photograph of yeah. the, the yeah. young, that's a student photograph and one of my personal favorites. And I allowed people the other day to feel the moss and Mark White was not happy <laughs> when I told him that I had, <laughs> this picture has to have the moss go with it. And you will see it strung over and it is crocheted or knitted and I've had an expert, my friend Sally, check that out and she couldn't tell whether it was knitted or crocheted, but it stretches from about this wall to the back of the room if you unwove you know, it. I mean, this is carefully made moss that came with the picture. So I, I've had a, um, I'm drawn to unusual processes and I love the human hand in photographs. I mean, it's just, as you can tell, this is, reflects my eclectic taste at Sometimes very simple. Uh, I mean, I love the I love student work. I'm really drawn to that too. Talking about how eclectic collectors can be, um, someone that I've sold work to is uh, Ronald Lauder, who is uh, from Estee Lauder, uh, and he has collected over about a 25 year period photographs nothing but photographs of hand. And when you think about it, you know, you'd say, well, that'd take a lot of work. It would, you know, you, you'd have to really go out of your way to find those photos. Not really, because when you think about it, a, a lot of photographers over the history of photographers, at some point, probably so many named photographers that are in his collection, certainly represented, have photographed someone's hands, and they appear in photographs. He has nothing but, and someone said to me once, uh, oh, that, that just doesn't seem interesting at all. I said, look at a catalog of his collection, and I think you'll change your mind. Uh, there's another collector that, as a dealer, that I, I used to be uh, in an organization of, uh, of photo dealers, and we would do expositions in different cities around there. And there was a guy that would come every, every year and ask about photographs, do you have anything of, Coca-Cola with Coca-Cola in it. And I would say, well, I, I don't, I don't. He only collected photographs that had Coca-Cola represented them. Didn't have to be a can of Coca-Cola, didn't have to be a bottle, it had to be just something with, with the reference to Coca-Cola. When you think about it, Walker Evans made photographs back in the depression of billboards, Coca-Cola. I mean, think of, so eclectic 
can also be wonderful sometimes with sp specific kinds of collection. Now, this, this is an unusual photograph by Robert Heineken. I want her to, to, to let uh, Carol to tell you about um, how she came to get this photograph. Well, he one I got an envelope from him. I was one of his students, and I got a, and he explained in the envelope, which had this photograph in it, that for you could have this photograph for a hundred dollars. Okay, and I don't know how many he sent out, but and it was hit, it very representative of his work because he was very experimental, and it's the and if you think about it. All of the, he observed the um, evening, um, like CNN or news shows, television. News yeah, shows. the news people, and this is two of them sandwiched together. He to photographed his television, and then you know would would combine the imagery. He was very um, into. Uh, taking magazine, going through an entire magazine and cutting one page and three, ma three pages later cutting another page, combining them and making collages that, that made sometimes sense, sometimes made no sense. And they had, a, he used a lot of spontaneity, like he put together one project was he took a, a, all these magazines uh, that he would just take apart and then put them all back together, taking one page from each magazine. And he was just very, he was very observant and very much involved in stretching the voice of experimental photography. And uh, so anyway. Siegfried Hollis, uh, Death of the Maiden 2005 by Siegfried Hollis, who, who uh, died about a year ago. Uh, Siegfried had been here several times. Uh, we were was, very good friends. And was in, in San, lived in Santa Fe, was a working photographer. Can you describe this? It, 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 when I was going through, I, I had seen this body of work, but I really hadn't heard a description of, of it quite like when, when Carol told me her response to it. Well, what happened was I think the other day when some of you were up, upstairs for that lecture and this was in, put up on the wall just as you come into the entrance, and it really reflects the same idea that the Livia photograph that you first saw. That, and he used flashlights to illuminate. And what you have is this, um, the light on this figure of this woman on a rock. And then underneath it, you see this very, very elderly man that you can barely see even in the photographer. In the, uh, in the photograph, and I just had never really seen that idea. And the name of it is the uh, death, and the, death and the Maiden, which is a reference to what? An opera, I think, or Mozart, or... Anyway, I, saw, I realized it was the same idea behind what Frederick Summer was using when he was always showing you these disintegrating walls with his pictures. This is a, this is a Cibachrome print that was an er, not an early color process, I say early, it was probably became um, used by photographers. It was, e it was easy if you had a dark room to, uh, you know, and you didn't want to do more complicated C prints, you could work with Cibachrome prints and it was easier to produce, easier to make. They still weren't permanent, they, but they were a little bit more permanent. Anyway. Um, and in the, the colors, what's so interesting is he made these at night with a flashlight, as, as Carol said, but the colors are so intense. The reds are so much more intense than a cibachrome print, and that sort of distinguishes it in a way, the, the process. Uh, now, the portraits, there, there are some incredibly wonderful portraits in this, uh, this collection. Uh, this is one of my absolute favorites, and it's by, this is Susan Sontag. Uh, it's called Susan Sontag Critic, 1991, by Annie Leibovitz. But it didn't come from Annie Leibovitz directly, and I want Carol to tell you the story if, if she hadn't. And I love the way it's presented, by the way, with the corners, you know, uh, and because this is just a, this is maybe like a, what we'd call a proof print. Annie uh, would have an assistant that worked with her, would collect proofs. Anyway, my next door neighbor gave it to me for, as a present, and she used to be a studio director. I mean, she was like a, a, a major work. She worked in Annie Leibovitz's uh, studio. studio, and she just kind of moved to Norman and has taken up 
next door, my next door neighbor, and she gave it to me, and uh, I was deeply appreciative, but she did not want to take any credit for, for giving it to me or anything, but I just left it the way she gave it to me at Christmas. But what a wonderful way to get a, a beautiful photograph like this. I mean, and it is a beautiful photograph by Annie Leibovitz. Okay. Uh, George O'Keefe, certainly, uh, there's two photographs, or three photographs in the collection, uh, are in the exhibition today of George O'Keefe. There are more in your collection than that, but uh, tell me something about how uh, Todd, Todd Webb, or how you acquired this I photograph. I actually got these from Scheinbaum and Russick in Santa Fe, and I just bought all the ones she had available, because they were, uh, anyway, that was, how I, I got all of them, and they're eventually all going to come to the museum. And But as I told Mark when he was over, we were picking things to put in the show. I have to have something at home to look at. <laughs> so, Photographs anyway. of O'Keefe are, are, I mean, it's, it, it's almost like a genre in itself. Uh, so many good photographers, from Ansel Adams to Todd Webb to William Cliff, that you saw earlier, have photographed uh, O'Keefe. Um, and to me, they're always sort of brooding. Uh, she's always got the sort of you know serious pose. Um, uh, she sort of directs that. Uh, one of the interesting things, some of the most interesting photographs, of course, that I've ever seen, uh, are by her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. And um, if you have a chance someday to see those photographs, when she was young, she was a young student, went to New York, wanted to be exhibited in Stieglitz's gallery. And uh, he took her in, exhibited her, and, and they became married. Married, There were something like 60 years difference between them. Um, and he photographed her. Some of the most beautiful portraits I've ever seen are, are portraits of, of Georgia uh, made by Alfred Stieglitz. Um, this is Myron Wood. I love this, this photograph. Uh, I love the contrast in it. Uh, this is a very delicate print, and, and it's, very, it's wonderful to see this is very different. Is the, the contrast was what I think Marion was using in the, in in particular in this. The the everything that's going on in this makes this one of the more interesting O'Keefe portraits to me. Um, Laura Gilpin uh, was in uh, lived in Santa Fe. Um, when I I worked with Ansel Adams, I, I I was telling Mark earlier. I started my career. I was at the Cowboy Hall of Fame, National. Western Cowboy Museum today. <laughs> I, I still call it Cowboy Hall. And um, the first exhibition I ever curated, period, was with Ansel Adams. And I, I've you know, humorously said, since I've been working my way down ever since. But I was so privileged, privileged to be able to work with Ansel and um, create a unique exhibition of his work in the American West. He came to the museum, uh, lectured, and then invited me to come out and take his workshop. And he invited me to stay around a while. I ended up spending a summer with Ansel. Um, at the end of the time, he said, you can go back and you can be a curator. You can be a photographer. Uh, he says, but you know, what we really need at this stage, this was in 1975, he says, we need people who understand photography from all angles to, to be dealers, to, be, to work, uh, you know, to have galleries to, to uh, and he says, I'm, I'm sure there's nothing in Oklahoma like, like a photography gallery. Like, and, and there wasn't, of course, wasn't actually mo anything around uh, in the four states around it. So uh, he said, if you go, if you decide to go back to the museum and you decide to leave and you decide to open a gallery, which I would like, hope that you would do, he said, I will help you establish a, a stable of artists. And so I did precisely that. Within about six months of returning to the museum, I left opened a gallery, called Ansel up, and I said, okay, now you gotta do it. You gotta send me uh, people, and you gotta make, help me make contacts. And he did. One of the contacts that he made, uh, he introduced me to, was Lori Gilpin, who lived in Santa Fe at that time. She was in her 80s, early 80s. Uh, I went directly to, uh, at, with Ansel's introduction, I went directly to Santa Fe, met with her. Um, her photographs at the time, I, I was just, uh, she had been working from the 30s on photographed America. Uh, the, the Navajo actually did uh, a book, very well-known book called The Enduring Navajo, and did many portraits. She worked in different processes from platinum to silver, 
Uh, this is a particular, this is a silver print, but it's a particular paper that has a tone, tonality to it, a uh, specific paper that Kodak made for a while. And I saw these prints, and, and I, I asked her at the time, you know, uh, what, what they were, how much they were. Well, they were $150. And I said, that just doesn't seem right, where I was given your, your you know, your reputation and, and your history. And said, well, that's what they are. And so um, I, I not only took her into the gallery to represent, but I, I it was the, the first photographs, some of the very first photographs I collected was Laura Gilbert started buying for myself. This being one of them, which I later sold to a collection and then uh, came to Carol. So sort of a circuitous route there. But Laura Gilpin was an incredible portraitist and, and a superb printer as well. Um, the history of photography is represented in this, in this collection, in Carol's collection, Paul Strand. Paul Strand was a contemporary of uh, Alfred Stieglitz and uh, would have known, been friends, befriended with uh, George O'Keefe. Um, uh, this is a photogravure. It's a different process that was, uh, was used, a printing process, more with like an ink printing process. Uh, where did this come from? Do you remember? No. Okay. I, 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 I was, uh, the, the, he did a, por a photogravure portfolio. It's possible that it came from a broken portfolio. It could have, but it, it may have come from the Friends of Photography. I'm, I'm not sure, yeah, but. But, but uh, anyway, it did? Portfolio. Oh, from a portfolio. Uh, from the portfolio. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it may have come from the portfolio. Yeah, Alfred Stieglitz. Speaking of that, by and and this is where this came from is fascinating too. Alfred Stieglitz, of course, I mean, giant in the history of photography and, and art and modern art in America to begin with. Um, this was a, a a very late photograph, 1946, by Henri Cartier-Bresson. Can you tell them where this came from? Yes, and I actually saw this in Beaumont Newhall's a History of Photography that if you ever want to read, it's only about a, a half an inch thick, but it's really the best writ written of the, all, the bo all the histories of photography. And I saw this, and it was a request from me to Janet Russick, and she called him in Paris and bought this for me. It's hard to imagine. I mean, today that would be so difficult to do. At the time, probably not as difficult, but still quite difficult. Well, it was just he printed it for me, and I just loved. It. I've loved it. This is one of the ones I'm taking home with me, by the way, that I loaned because I love it so much. I want it up all the time, and that's another thing. You know, you just buy things because you just have to have them. And this is one I just have to ha had to have. And this is another? And this is another one. I did give this one because I was an English major as an undergraduate, and I loved Faulkner. And so one of the ones that he all, this is also Cartier-Bresson. But uh, the Cartier-Bresson, the one before, was actually photographed about two months before Alfred Stieglitz died. And Cartier-Bresson uh, was there and took, that, uh, took this picture. It, it's, what's interesting to me, if, if <clears throat> the more photographs you see of Stieglitz, so many were made in his gallery in New York. This is a day bed uh, where he would take a nap in the afternoon. And uh, so many photographs were made on this, in this very same position by a number of different photographers who would go to try to photograph Stieglitz. And they said his response, and, and, and you know, things I've read, his response was always, uh, you know, they would ask him to do this or stand, and no, and he said, you got to take me where I am, you know, and he, so, so many photographs have been made on this day bed, it's amazing, but this is really one of the most beautiful photographs, I think, of, of Stieglitz. It's showing his, certainly his age, and he's tired, and he's, he's uh, near the end of his life. And I think it's a very poignant portrait by Cartier-Bresson. I do too. This is one of my all. This is one of the major pieces that I just have to have up all. The, you know, I cycle things in and out, but these are the. This is one of the ones that I just put up and I keep up all the time. So. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. And this one. This is a Janet Russick. Now it's interesting too. In in the process of uh, with photography, it's not. To me, I've seen and met so many more dealers, uh, photography dealers, uh, who 
began as photographers or who are photographers, like myself. Um, and then it, it's not quite the same, I think, with other mediums. I mean, you go in other galleries where the where paintings and there's a, you, the, the, the people that are representing the, the dealers are, don't particularly have a history as, as a painter. There's certainly more, seems to be more so with photography. Janet Russick and her husband, uh, David Scheinbaum, uh, have, a, have a gallery and dealers in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, this is where uh, uh, Carol met them. And I think it's always, it's wonderful to make those connections, but it's even more wonderful when they're a good photographer like this, and, and you certainly appreciated her work. And As I said, this, this collection covers history of photography. Uh, August Sander, German photographer who did an exhaustive uh, study of the German people. And uh, this is, though, an ex sort of an exception. He, he did, uh, he would do butchers, uh, tradesmen, I mean, people that were, you know, uh, just sort of typical German, everyday sort of people. This is not typical. No, this particular one was the one I, because I used to show, he had designed an arc of German society, and this was like uh, previous, he began the arc before the Third Reich came into power. And at one point, of course, this got a lot of exposure. And, and he represented, this is a homeless man who was uh, an unemployed, it says in the book, an unemployed man. But it kind of reminds me of, uh, anyway, well, this was one of the five, because he was reflecting the whole of German society in this arc. Of, and he put artists and philosophers at the very top of the arc. They were the, the cream of the crop in German society. But this, he also included this, and at one point, and I'm not sure there was, a, but his whole studio burned down. And it was, had been set on fire. And uh, so I'm not sure, but he, this, I asked, I found this, um, it's not an original print, but his son printed it because he died, what, in about 1960, maybe? And so I've always loved this one. And uh, it, it, Given the choice, though, when you see the, the well-known August Sander images, given the choice between one of those and this, what made you choose this? Because I thought it was more a reflection of uh, universal, uh, it had, had a more universal voice to me of, of the disenfranchised, as we are very well aware of everywhere, and even in our own country. But anyway, I just, I just felt, I just was drawn to this. Some things you just know that you want it. And I, that's another thing, you just know you have to have it. And so Janet was responsible for finding mm -hmm. this for me. And it was printed by August Sanders' son, but it was not by him, it was printed by him. And this is Friends of Photography, an, another one that I got in the full Monty, so to speak, when I would buy all of them. Marsha Burns uh, was uh, most active in the 80s. Um, uh, she did, uh, and, and I'm kind of here, I'm getting into sort of street portraiture. That's another thing, sort of a running theme through some of this, street portraiture. Uh, not exactly documentary yet, but street. Uh, this Alessandro Rome was just a, a young man that he, she, she found on the streets of Rome. Um, if you look at this, the, the curious thing about it, if you look at the, the top of it, you see the holes going across the, the top of the image there. That's because this was made from a Polaroid negative a four by five inch, she had a four by five inch camera she'd have to set up on a tripod and you could buy Polaroid uh, uh, film that produced not only, you know, when you make Polaroid and you separate it and you pull the print off and you have a four by five inch image there, you know, from um, uh, on, on the Polaroid image, uh, or almost four by five inch, uh, you also, it produced a negative. And you had to take that negative in the field or at that moment and put it in a little, a bucket of, of uh, chemical and it would preserve it and you might go through the city, she might have gone through the city of Rome that day making several portraits, carrying her bucket, carrying her camera 
And, but when she would get back to the studio, then she would print it. She was, she was proud of the fact that she, did, that she worked this way, so she wanted to, to use what we call the rebate edge of the negative, which is the, the holes that you see up there. That's where it separates when you pull it, and it comes off of, uh, you know, it, it comes directly uh, onto the negative, and so she printed it that way, so you see the edges of the, the rebate edge of the, of the knife, which I've always think was fascinating. But this is an incredibly beautiful print in person. Such a long tonal range and beauty. Um, Karen uh, Thurman was a... Uh, no, she's a present faculty member at OU. Yes, what well, is. And I tried to honor two people from OU and two from Santa Fe. And she, what I was about to say, she, was, uh, she was, was a student for several sessions at the Oklahoma Arts Institute, studied with a number of photographers, a uh, very fine photographer herself. I, this is beginning to get in sort of the documentary realm to me. Uh, I, I, I love the photograph, I love the, I love the title, Donnie Vomit, friend. Who's an Oki? Yeah, Donnie Vomit and friend from the Coney Island series, so you can imagine the Coney Island. But the Donnie Vomit is on the left. Um, what, what, what attracted you about this photograph? I, I just, I know her and I just like the Coney Island series. series, series. And also I wanted to interrupt this, does anyone have a question so far? Anybody have a question? Because we've been sitting here for a while. Maybe you can take some. We can take questions. We'll finish and go through, and then take questions. Okay, at the end, let's if that's just right. finish yeah. these, and then, yeah. and then this is a fabulous picture that is from a notable Santa Fe photographer who happens to be in the audience tonight, and I've warned him that he has to stand up and show himself. This is Herbert Lotz, and he took this picture. And he shows this whole series of pictures in several exhibitions that are upcoming. And Two images from this exhibition right here. Uh huh. And then this, Herbert, would you like to tell them about, it's just a break from hearing us drone on, about this series, which I love this story. He talked the other day in the gallery, but the other people haven't heard this. But there were how many? Fifteen, and we and we we have three upstairs that are in that series, and they're so poignant. And I was an AIDS volunteer in the '80s here, and everybody I knew, I mean, many people I knew, even the people that were in our group, support group for AIDS, just died, and I, it was just puzzling, bewildering, and sad. And what I've loved about these pictures forever is that it shows who are we to judge, who, who are you, to, who, who you love. And to show, that's what all these photographs mean, is people who love each other in committed relationships that had all of this sadness as part of their world. I just always love them. And this is a recent photograph of a artist who is from... Connecticut? Yeah, no, she's where, where, where is Salem? It, this is from Massachusetts. Okay. Okay. And she showed it at, uh, at uh, JRB, and this was the one I liked because she had all these blue healers. These were all her dogs. And then she did these uh, little girls dressed up like witches on Halloween. And so this was my favorite picture from she, the whole yeah, show. Yeah, she was from Salem uh, for a long time, I think, and, and did a whole series with little, little children dressed like witches 
uh, and it, it was part of that exhibition. But again, through a gallery in Oklahoma City, this is how you acquired this photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, I just loved it. And then these are all Donna Wallace, who many of you probably knew when she was still doing photography. So More documentary again. Uh-huh. These two photographs fascinated me. I, I, the, the show is beautifully marked, beautifully installed, and beautifully, I, I think, uh, put together. Sometimes I think images, the way you, you, as a gallerist, I certainly discovered, believed in this, the way you hang two images side by side can make such a difference. Uh, it can say something, you know, a little bit more about one image or the other or both of the images. But certainly when you have an, uh, the ability as a curator, to go through and make selections and put things together. And, and I love the way these two images, uh, Luis Gonzalez Palma on the right, um, that's his, is a well-known photographer, certainly. And this is another example of a photograph that has been painted on extensively. Uh, I mean, it's the, there's basis in photography, but it's been manipulated and painted so, so much that it's taken into a multimedia project. But this is someone that I had never seen until I saw this photograph or had never known about. And, and this is a friend who used to be the chief curator at the Ardmore, uh, at the, uh, what's the name of the gallery in Ardmore? Uh, Goddard the Goddard yes. Center. And he was the man who, he was the exhibitor there. And he did all these photographs. And this is of the local postman. <laughs> and what you can't see in the back ground is the wings and this this is Icarus and it's about this size if you've been upstairs and I bought it with the frame and everything and Rudy Rudy has not seen the exhibit yet but anyway that's how so I got the picture how wonderful to be able to take a photograph by someone like this uh, unknown relatively unknown I guess beautiful photograph you could hang this in a museum along with Palma's piece and you, you might think it was it was his. You might think it was another well-known, you know, certainly better-known photographer. And but, I, but the, I also wanted to say that I, the first time I saw the show, I didn't even know what to expect, and I waited about two or three weeks before I ever even show it, saw it installed. And I was there with a friend from Ardmore, and I started just crying. I was so touched for the beautiful installation. And that is another thing. I just wanted to t t thank Mark and the people who did that. And they just did the most beautiful install. I could not be happier with, e with everything. The way this work of mine for, the, for my whole life, this has been my, my gift to OU. And I've just worked, I've just spent a fortune, but it was all money. I knew that I was always going to have money coming in because I have worked my whole life very hard and I knew that I was going to get all this money coming in at the end of my life. So I just took all the money that my brother-in-law made for me in the 90s and spent it on photographs. So and what you're now seeing is, uh, and money is no object. Mm -hmm. Believe me, when you are a passionate collector of anything, and fortunately I picked something and collected at a time when most of many things that I bought, I knew were gonna be extremely valuable, but that depended on whether I was willing to part with them. And but I wasn't. The, as I said in the beginning, the sustainability of photography, this, as having known Carol as long as I have, I know for a fact that it has sustained her. Uh, and I know that this collection that she's donating to the, to the uh, university will sustain the collection that's already here, wonderful and I, collection. I mean, and still looking, I'm still looking. I'm telling you, I've already bought three or four more photographs since then. <laughs> since this one went up and someone said, well, where did you put all of these, all the pictures? Because I have this tiny house that's maybe three times as big as the stage. And I just, when I move home from Santa Fe, I packed up my car and brought it all to the museum, met them in front, they unloaded it, and that was what I had always intended to do, and I thought, what better moment than this? And so, and I mean, there are so many, and I just am crazed. I'm a crazy person who has been set loose in the world of photography 
and have been willing to part with money without even a thought. When you want something and you have the money to buy it, you don't even think about the money. You just know you have it. And my mother used to say that I couldn't say, I, she said, you can't keep a dollar <laughs> in your life, can you? And I said, no, mother. Anyway, There's I just love, I've, uh, I've, I've, I'm so happy that all of you came this evening. And There's a fam famous saying that, that we're just caretakers of art. And the better caretakers are the better collectors, I think. I think I'm a caretaker. I, I always knew true. that I was going to. You know, you get, to, I'm 80 years old, and I, this is my gift to all of you, and I, uh, and, and to Oklahoma, and I wanted to let you know that I'm a, was actually born in, I hate to tell you, Austin, Texas, I mean, talking about it, uh, being in a, a, a foreign climb, but anyway, my father was born in Bokoshi. Oklahoma, and he graduated from OU in 1934. And his, his, my grandfather was a doctor in Tulsa, so I consider myself this my beloved home, and all of this, and I love my life at OU, and I feel like I'm the most fortunate person in the world. And my friend Herb at the back of the room is a friend from the 70s, and we, we have spent our, our time together, because I haven't seen him in a while, talking about how lucky we all are to be here in Oklahoma. What a great place it is. Do, do we have any time for questions? Or? Well, I'm wondering if you might entertain questions outside where we've been. Okay. Oh, that's oh, yeah. right. We okay. have, a, yeah. have a whole thing. We have refreshments. And so, uh, the museum closes in about 35 minutes. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, my gosh. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank for you. coming. Unhook me from this. Yeah, here, let me do Thank this. You.